This episode features soulful simplicity author and Jomo, the Joy of Missing Out advocate, Courtney Carver. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. If you're an adventurer or even a human, the chances are you've experienced some FOMO. Or maybe you've experienced overwhelm or the feeling of being too busy, or you've had this deep desire to be more okay with just where you are now. Maybe you've had a yearning to live more simply, and maybe you just want to adventure inside as much as you do out. Well, today's guest, Courtney Carver, was a fast-paced ad exec living a little above her means when she got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease MS or multiple sclerosis. She says it forced her to remake her entire life, and she wrote a book about it called Soulful Simplicity that hit me to the core when I read it. There's some books that just really resonate, and this was one of them. And to get a little deep and personal on you, I've been struggling with an autoimmune disease called vitiligo. It's also exacerbated by stress, and I talk about it at the beginning of the show. I actually get a little more personal in the beginning of the show than I do on most of my podcasts, but pretty quickly, Courtney and I get right into it. Courtney gives a lot of advice, how-tos, tricks and tips on how to minimize your life, how to declutter, and how to be less busy. We also talk about why living with less has given her so much more, and how to have more JOMO and less FOMO. I love this woman. I love her book and this episode. I know we get deep at the start, but I think this conversation gets better as it goes on and it's chocked full of info. Enjoy. Courtney, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. I'm so excited to have you. You know, when I read your book this year, it hit me to the core. And I normally don't talk this much on podcasts, but I really loved your book. You talk about how your lifestyle wasn't working for you when you got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and you're forced to make positive changes in your lifestyle. And that, that was just really big for me. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. So yeah, of course. And we just talked about La Jolla and how you're going to come down and surf with me, but I just want to start with the fact that I have an autoimmune condition and I don't talk about it much. It's called vitiligo. It affects 1% of the population and it's where your melanocytes attack each other and your skin loses its pigment. And I first noticed it when I was living and surfing in New Zealand and my lips were turning a little white and I just thought it was a sunburn. But then it spread a little bit and it only affects my body aesthetically, but it's really forced me to not only confront vanity head on since it affects my face, but it's also forced me to take a closer look at my lifestyle choices, how I spend my time, who I spend it with, how I choose my thoughts and the information I consume and subscribe to, and what I put in and on my body. So granted, I got this while surfing, living free in New Zealand, worry-free. I do understand that when I have stress and with a lot of autoimmune conditions, it's like pouring kerosene or gasoline onto a fire. And when I'm less stressed, the pigment has definitely come back. And because I have white skin, it's really hard to tell, but it's there. So I want to start with that because you said something similar in your book about stress is like pouring gasoline onto an autoimmune disease. And, and I know that your words affected me in your book. And I think I'm sure it has affected many and I know it will affect listeners. So I guess I just want to start with your background a little bit. You know, what were you doing before you got diagnosed with MS? And maybe you can just talk a little bit about what it is. Sure. Well, before I was diagnosed with MS, I was living the American dream. And I say that kind of in jest because I think that I thought I was doing and living my dream, but really what I was doing was just going in every single direction, full on overspending, overworking, overwhelmed, nonstop, or at least you know, looking back, that's really what it felt like. But I Mm -hmm. thought that was normal. I thought it was normal to be stressed out all the time, to be busy all the time, to be inundated with stress and had never really taken any time to consider that I had built my life that way until this 
MS diagnosis. And while, of course, I would never wish a, an MS diagnosis or an autoimmune condition on anyone, I really think, and it sounds like you kind of noticed this too, that it, it gives us this great permission to finally pay attention to what's going on in our lives and, and notice places we might be able to make changes. And for people who, who don't know, I'll just quickly tell you yeah. that MS is an autoimmune condition that really looks different for each person that has it. The symptoms vary um, pretty dramatically from person to person. You know, anything from symptoms from vertigo and fatigue that were my main symptoms at first to tingling in your hands, numbness, um, cognitive issues, uh, mobility issues, lots of different things can happen because essentially what's happening is your blood cells that are supposed to be fighting infection go haywire and literally eat the myelin off of your um, nerves. And I equate that to like a, if you think about an electrical cord, that plastic coating that protects the, the actual electrical cord, uh, that's myelin on your nerves. And when it's exposed, you start to short circuit is the, is the easiest way to, to think about it. Wow. And you have it forever, I guess. It's not something you can beat or it, there's cure. no official cure for it. Um, but with lifestyle changes and for some people, including myself, um, traditional therapies, you can, um, live a, a relatively normal life or an extraordinary life. Even, uh, I haven't had a relapse or even very many symptoms in more than 10 years. Wow. That's awesome. So one of the things you talk about so beautifully in your book is how you made a move to live with less. And that became incredibly impactful for you, both emotionally and, and health wise. Can you just talk a little bit about, let's talk materially, like how did you move towards minimalism? Well, at first I didn't, it wasn't this kind of obvious path for me. At first, my sole goal was to figure out how people were living well with MS and see if I could replicate some of those things. And in all the research that I did, it really kept coming back to stress and how to reduce stress. And so I just started looking at all the stressful things in my life and trying to remove them one by one. And at some point I realized that the common thread in, in all of the changes that I was making was simplicity. And so by the time I got to my clutter and stuff and those physical possessions that we're talking about, uh, I realized that even though I didn't think that was stressful, my stuff, it was, it was this reminder of my debt and discontent that I always, you know, was buying new things and overspending and in a lot of debt and it, it was stressful and I started to eliminate it. And you were, were you a magazine sales executive? Is that, is that what you were? I was. Okay. So I, yeah, I worked for close to eight years in, in advertising for city regional magazines. And so those forced you to, I mean, you kind of have to dress nice. You're going to sales meetings. It is so stressful. I mean, it is really like just dollars and deadlines, meeting sales goals, meeting clients, events, um, sales meetings, reporting. It, it was nonstop. So how did you start cutting out? Like I, I read that you cut your wardrobe down to 30, is it 33 items? 33 items. 33 yeah. items. And you had one dress, which for a sales executive as a female, not always the easiest thing to pull off when you have to go to a lot of events. It was really interesting. You would think it would be challenging, but it in fact wasn't that challenging. So I created this fashion challenge back in 2010 called Project 333 in response to my closet that was totally out of control. And I just wanted to know what enough meant to me. And so I created this, these rules where for three months I would dress with only 33 items, um, including shoes, jewelry, clothes, and accessories, um, not including sleepwear, underwear, or workout clothes. 
Uh, although workout clothes have to work out. So I was really guilty of wearing yoga pants when I wasn't even <laughs> going to yoga. And I think we all are. And, and which is fine. But if, if that were the case, I wanted to count them in that, those 33 True. items. And it was so interesting that those first three months, because I didn't tell anyone that I worked with that I was doing this challenge. And I had put so much energy into what I wore and convinced myself over time that people really, uh, or that I was what I wore, you know, that I was powerful if I was wearing a certain pair of shoes or people would think I was more professional or successful if I dressed in a certain way. And in taking this challenge, I realized that nobody really cares what I'm wearing. Nobody noticed, nobody noticed that I wore the same black dress to every event for a full year. Um, no one noticed that I was dressing with the same items over and over again. And I think that's because a, even when we have full closets, most of us are wearing the same things over and over again. You know, we're gravitating towards our favorite items. Uh, but it was a, a real wake up call for me that I had spent way too much time, money, energy, and attention on my wardrobe when I didn't need to. And I mean, now it's been over eight years and I still practice 33 items approximately every three months, uh, only because it makes my life so much better in the most fascinating ways. I think people can experience that when they go to a hotel and they're on vacation and they only have so many items to wear and it's so easy to get dressed. And yeah, you're doing that whole, every day. Yeah, and I think the whole hotel experience is a great example of that because uh, usually, I'm not saying in every instance, but usually you have everything you need with what they supply and you're not missing all your excess stuff at home. And you really get to focus on the city you're visiting or whatever it is that you're doing that is putting you in into a hotel space. But it's good practice, I think, for simplicity, just to see how comfortable you can be with fewer items. You know, my partner and I practice minimalism. I, I don't know if it's by choice or just because we've been living out of our suitcase, traveling around the world so much. And I think there's a lot of listeners here who hike the PCT and other big trails that are used to living with less. But there's also a lot of people where, you know, getting rid of things is hard for them. So what questions do you ask when you have to get rid of things? So for example, you know, there's Marie Kondo who says, does this bring me joy? And then if it doesn't, she throws it out. But I also read this recent book by a Japanese writer who said, you know, would I buy it again if I lost it? And I thought those were interesting questions. Like what questions do you use to, to sort of decipher what you keep and what you get rid of? I mean, typically, and the, the way that I kind of went through the process, especially when I struggled to let go of things is instead of, and I did ask some questions, but my go-to was really creating some distance between me and my stuff before letting it go mm. so that I wouldn't have that angst of, oh my gosh, what if I need this? Or am I going to have to rebuy it? Uh, so instead I would just hide everything, put it in a box and hide it for 30 days or three months or however long it took. And if I either couldn't remember what I had hidden, which was generally the case, or I realized I didn't need it, it was much easier to let go to have that little bit of separation without the panic of it being all the way gone. Uh, and now of course that I'm kind of on the other side of that and have decluttered you know, a house full of stuff uh, downsized from 2000 square feet to a small apartment. It, it's different now. You know, I really think much more about what comes in versus what goes out now because most of the stuff is out already. And um, so I don't want stuff that is going to take up a lot of space that things that I have to take care of unless it's really adding value to my life. So I don't think it's a bad thing to have things. I just think it it improves my life if I have the things that really support me and what I enjoy doing. Is there a couple of examples you can share of things that were hard to get rid of or things that you really do now enjoy having? Ooh, well, like I really enjoy my coffee machine. <laughs> I was going to ask you, I was going to say, is it a good coffee machine or? Yes, I really like coffee. So I like having coffee 
in my home. And that's one thing that I really enjoy owning. Um, I actually have, uh, and this would be something that people wouldn't think is a necessity and it's not, but I have an egg cooker because I like to eat eggs and, uh, I like them soft boiled. And I find that it's much easier to cook them in this egg cooker than in a pot of water. It's more reliable. So that might seem a little extra, but it fits me and my lifestyle. And I think that's the other really interesting thing about simplicity and minimalism is that what's right for me may not be right for you. We kind of all have to figure out what works best for us and be questioning that on an ongoing basis as our lives change, which they are constantly doing. So what what other advice you give to people like as to where should they start when getting rid of stuff? So, you know, one way is to start with your closet but there's got to be other places to start. Yeah, I, I say start where you're most either most curious or interested uh, or where you think you can relieve the most amount of stress immediately, which I, I think even though I didn't start in my closet, had I known how much stress I would relieve by starting there, that's where I would have started. Uh, and also because it's kind of contagious. You know, once you see how simplifying one area of your home can make a big difference on not just the big picture, but on your day to day life, like make your mornings easier or that you save money almost immediately by not shopping and bringing more things in. It, it's contagious. And you think about it in other areas of your home and your calendar and, and your overall life. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. When we come back, Courtney shares her relationship with hiking, more about how to be less busy and the art of JOMO. Guess what? Saturday, September 22nd is National Public Lands Day. Not sure what a public land is? Well, they're not just the epic national parks you might think of like Yosemite and Zion. Public lands include your neighborhood park, your local bike paths, mountains, grasslands, waters, even the beach paths you run and some of the beach parks where you shower off after you surf so you don't take sand back to wherever you're going next. These are all public lands and they're ours to take care of. So this National Public Lands Day, get outside and take a friend. You can also get outside on a public land with REI and sign up for an REI stewardship class or event at rei.com forward slash stewardship dash events. That's rei.com forward slash stewardship dash events. So besides reducing stuff like material stuff, you know, I'm really interested in how we can reduce time spent on BS, like emails, meetings, responding to like an, a text that then you have to respond to the text that then causes another response. You know, this is really important for people, I think, who live an adventurous lifestyle. But, you know, you talked a little bit about being busy and how you had this busy, busy life, but being busy is completely addictive. And it's one of those socially accepted addictions today. So it's not acceptable socially to be an alcoholic, but to be a workaholic is, is pretty acceptable still socially in our society. Sure. I mean, we, pra we praise each other's busyness and we yeah. kind of fuel that fire every time we talk. I mean, just think about half the conversations you have in a day, maybe even more where you say, Hey, how are you? The first thing the other person says is I'm busy. I'm so busy. We have to start talking about more interesting things and asking better questions to avoid that rabbit hole. Because what it does, at least in my experience, is it shuts down the conversation and the connection. Because as soon as somebody tells me how busy they are, all I can hear is, I'm too busy for you. I'm too busy to talk about this. And I know they're checked out and they're thinking about what they're busy doing. Uh, so for people who we want to have genuine connection and conversation with, I think we have to shift to the conversation. And instead of asking, how are you? And leaving room for that, we have to say, you know, what, what has sparked your interest this week? Or what's been mm. making you smile lately? It's because I know we have better things to talk about, uh, especially, you know, the adventurous people that you're talking about that are out there exploring and seeing amazing things. Um, certainly, we have something better to talk about than how busy we are. Yeah. I, I hate when people say I'm busy, like, and it runs pretty deep in my family. We 
I'm from a family of total overachievers and it's great, but it comes with a little bit of a cost. And so I try to never say I'm busy when someone says, how are you? Even if I'm totally overwhelmed, I try to be honest, but not say I'm busy, but like, how else can we not be so busy? Like, what are some tools you used to just find a more balanced lifestyle? Uh, number one boundaries. Like we have to start creating boundaries around the things that really matter to us. So, and the boundaries are not just for other people, but for ourselves and constantly redefining those boundaries. So for instance, I've recently removed email from my phone because I started to notice that checking email wasn't productive anymore for me. It was just this habit of seeing what was in my inbox but I wouldn't respond until I was home by my computer and I would just be collecting all of this data and information and and filling my brain with stuff that I wasn't acting on. And it was this compulsive, like I'm just standing in line at the bank. So I'm going to check my email or I'm waiting for this. So I'm going to check my email. And so I, I just took it off the phone. Like I, I can't be trusted with email on my phone, not to, distract myself and kind of remove myself from wherever I am by dipping into this thing that I'm not even doing anything with. So that for me really helped, um, taking the email off the phone and just dealing with it, you know, once or twice a day instead of 10 times a day or 20 times a day. I don't know what the statistics are right now, but it's obscene how often we are looking at our phones for no apparent reason. Yeah. And it's addictive. I mean, social media, what is your approach to that? Do you have in, I'm guessing you don't have Instagram on your phone. I do. You I do. have Instagram on my phone. So it's the, the one kind of social media thing that I have on my phone because I don't think you can really do, you can't Instagram do it on your computer. Your computer. No. <laughs> I've tried. And yeah. And it's a part of my business. Yep. Um, so I typically post, uh, once a day, and I'm probably on Instagram more frequently. Uh, but I notice that when I'm not, when I just go on that once a day and post and do a couple of other things, I'm less distracted. So anything that we can do to kind of remove these distractions, like if, if you have notifications on your phone, I highly recommend turning them all off. Um, other than maybe hearing the phone ring or getting a text message, you know, why do we need a notification when we get email or when somebody mentions us on social media or whatever, there's so many notifications happening. And even if we're not re reacting or responding to them, they're pulling us out of the moment. So, I mean, I've had lunch with people whose phones sit on the table and they just <laughs> buzz throughout the entire me meal. Nuts. And I'm like, don't you need to look at that? Like, is this an emergency? What's happening? It bothers me. And it's not even my notification. Unless you're an emergency room doctor, like I Correct. don't see why you have notifications on your phone. So yeah. one of the other great things that you talk about is JOMO, which I never heard before. JOMO is the opposite of FOMO, the fear of missing out. As an adventurer, and I know a lot of the people listening to this podcast, we all experience FOMO. I get it mostly when I see people surfing perfect waves in Costa Rica when it's cold winter time, which isn't really that cold in San Diego, or I don't know, I'm busy working and I just see people surfing. I'm like, ah, I have a little bit of FOMO, but you introduced this concept of JOMO. I love it. Can you talk about it? Yeah. So the joy of missing out, uh, and I've heard recently, uh, Lomo, the love of missing out, Ooh, which I, I like really like as well. Lomo. Uh, yeah. And it's really, I guess, because I used to try to do everything all the time and they weren't always amazing things, but just, I just always had this feeling of, I want to be, you know, in it and I want to be keeping up and staying connected. And I, I was just doing too much and I couldn't enjoy any of it because there was just too much going on. And so through this whole process of simplifying and redefining my work and taking better care of myself, I've realized that I'm an introvert and not the extrovert that I thought I was. Uh, and I really love missing out. I find great joy in saying no and staying home 
or choosing something completely different than what's being offered. But so often with FOMO, like we're just on the hunt for opportunity and invitations and, and it's hard to say no, because what if you miss out? And I just kind of twist that around and say, what if I do like, then what? I'm probably going to be better because of it. So how do you say no as a, as an author, that's pretty high profile. Now your book's done really well and you must get hit up a lot. It takes some practice, but once you have done that practice, it really gets pretty easy, especially if I'm working on a project. So I'm working on a new book now, which makes it really easy for me to say, I'm sorry, I can't, or I'm, I'm focusing on this right now. So I'm not doing any of this thing for the next couple of months. Uh, and I just know that there's such limited, not only time, but attention that I have during the day. It's not like if I have 10 hours to write that I'm going to write for 10 hours. I, it, it's a small window of creative flow that I want to be able to harness. And so that takes some downtime. It takes exercise. It takes journaling. It takes lots of things that have, you know, don't seem to be completely related to writing or creating. And I think we all need that in our lives. We need to create some buffer um, to support the things that we love doing. And that means saying no to a lot of things that, you know, we may not, we don't have to hate doing them, but we just can't, we know we can't fit it all in and do it well. I appreciate that you said that writing isn't like an hourly thing. It takes, it takes your whole day of having the time and space to be able to write. That's awesome. Yes. I mean, as a writer, I, I mean, really I, appreciate you saying that. Yeah. I spend a lot of time getting ready to write, which yeah. sometimes I think can turn into procrastination, but usually it really is this. It's your process. Uh, yeah, it is. It's a process. So you know, how you find Jomo, you know, is, is this downtime, but I've also read that one of the ways you find joy is, is hiking. I love hiking. So yeah, talk to me about your love of hiking and how, how is like hiking really played a part of your life and, and in helping you heal? Well, I grew up in uh, New Hampshire and that's where I met my husband and he is the one that really got me excited about hiking. And I think one of our, you know, first few dates was a hike, uh, in the white mountains. And after that, I was just hooked and we did a lot of Appalachian mountain club huts where, and I don't know, I'm not as familiar with the PCT, but, uh, if they have kind of huts along the way, but I know, I think the Appalachian uh, trail is more, more famous for huts. I haven't really okay, done, yeah, I've, I've so been they a little have bit these, on it. Like, yeah really cool propane run huts sprinkled throughout, um, the entire trail, I think, but we only did, um, kind of new England, New Hampshire huts and we would hike up and spend the night. And, you know, really that was part of a big part of the beginning of our relationship and getting to know each other and falling in love. And as I was falling in love with him, I was falling in love with the mountains and the forest and, it was just, just became a part of me. And now we live in Salt Lake city. We've been here for almost 15 years and the, the hiking out here is just crazy. I mean, you could hike every day. I think we could hike every day and never hike everything. So it's always a a new adventure or even visiting our, our favorite trails in bigger little cottonwood. Uh, it's, it's just very, it, it's really connecting for us to do that, um, but also so soothing and healing and just a reminder of what matters to me to get my feet on dirt is the, the, <laughs> the only way to describe it. Uh, and then in the winter, uh, we like to ski out here as well. That's awesome. Yeah, Utah sounds amazing. We have a, a friend and a girl I interviewed on the podcast who started a, a company and nonprofit called Hike It Baby, where she gets moms to go hiking. And she just moved to Utah and says it's just awesome for that. Yeah, it's incredible. So what else besides hiking brings you joy? I know coming to La Jolla to write brings you joy. Anything else that you just love doing? Well, I love writing. Uh, it's something that even if I'm not working on a specific project, I'm doing almost daily. Uh, even if I'm not writing for anyone else, or even if I'm never going to re 
like reread what I write, just the process of putting words on paper really brings me joy. Um, I practice a morning routine that I look forward to every day that includes a little bit of writing and uh, meditating and stretching out and just to have that daily touch point of doing, doing something for myself uh, before serving my work or anyone else brings me a lot of joy. Uh, spending time with my husband and daughter and her puppy, uh, those are, that's probably my favorite <laughs> thing right now. Can you talk a little bit about what your next book is, is on? Yeah. So the next book is all about um, Minimalist Fashion Challenge Project 333, which we were just talking about. How is, how is the book tour for Soulful Simplicity? Like what, what's the process been like of being a big published author? I mean, it doesn't sound like you set out to write the book you thought you were going to write. Yeah, it's been, it, it's been, uh, it feels like I worked on it forever and then it was published and now I'm on to something else. So the actual publishing and having the book out there seems like the, sh the smallest piece of it. Even though I know people are continuing to read it, which is really exciting, um, it's, it's just an interesting process because it's something that took me, you know, years to think about and write and submit and edit and finally get published. So it's just an interest. It's been an interesting ride for sure. Well, I think it was a great example of a wild idea to write a book about this very personal story that has helped a lot of people. Well, thank you. It, it was, it was great to write. I loved writing it. And people often talk about how painful it is to write books and the writing process, but I really enjoyed it. So any, any stories of people who've been really affected by the book that you can share? Wow. That's a, a big question. Definitely. I'm trying to think of some specific examples. Um, it always surprises me how profound the, the project 333 challenges for people uh, because I knew that it would relieve stress and and make mornings a little bit easier for people. But I'll sometimes hear, and I've heard from many people on this on this end that it's it's helped them through anxiety and depression struggles, which is really powerful. I mean, to to take something that is so, you know, focused on clothes on hangers, to transforming your mindset um, and a, a mental condition, it's it's pretty huge. That's awesome. So where can people learn just in a little bit more detail how to do the project before your book comes out? Can they just go to your website? Yes. You can either Google Project 333 or if you go to my website, bemorewithless.com, there's a button on there for Project 333. Awesome. Any advice to those who have an autoimmune disease? It can be just so confusing. There's no cure for most of them. There's like a million different answers. I've tried lots of things, creams and potions. And I tried fasting for five days. The first time totally worked. Second time, it was so stressful to like not eat for five days that it really didn't do anything. For me, stress has been like not having stress has been the best. I think if we're willing to experiment, like you're talking about right now, then that means we have hope that we can relieve some of the, the pain and suffering and perhaps even be better on the other side because of it. So I just think it's that, like keep experimenting, keep figuring out what works best for you and don't dismiss crazy ideas. I mean, I'm always asking myself, not just about this, but everything. Like, wouldn't it be crazy if? And answering that question and then following through with action has led to amazing things in my life. So just don't dismiss anything. And if something sounds completely crazy, think about how you might modify it for yourself. Or if it's not a, you know, a risk to your health, then try it for a few days or a few months and see what happens. I think that we have to stop dismissing things and, and saying never and really mm. challenge, challenging those nevers. I think that's great advice. How about just those who want to live with less and be less busy? 
Oh, learn to say no. I mean, that's the, really the first step. We're, we're over committing for sure. So learn to say no. And, and for people who really struggle with that because they're people pleasers or feel like they just have to say yes, I recommend doing a yes fast. So oh, that's awesome. Say like for 14 days or 30 days, you're not saying yes to anything. And then you have this built in excuse. So if you're not comfortable just saying no, thank you, you can say, uh, no, I'm doing this yes fast to see what will happen if I say no to everything for 30 days. Oh, that's awesome. I love the yes fast. You are a great writer. You must have read a lot growing up. And now what books are sparking your interest most right now? I am reading more fiction right now uh, only because I'm writing. And so sometimes yeah. when I'm writing nonfiction, I don't like to read other nonfiction because I think it can kind of seep into your brain and then you're not sure whose ideas are what. <laughs> Although I am reading some nonfiction, one book that I've read recently that I thought was so good was called, and it's fiction, uh, Something in the Water. Hmm. And then for nonfiction, I've just started to read, um, Anthony Bourdain's kitchen confidential. Yes. And then my friends, Mark and Angel Chernoff, um, from Mark and Angel hack life just published a book called getting back to happy. And that was one of my recent reads, uh, which was really great. So I kind of flit around from fiction to nonfiction, but mostly fiction while I'm writing. When are you going to be going out in the world on another tour? That's a great question. So a couple of years ago, I did this thing called the Tiny Wardrobe Tour, where I actually brought my 33-item wardrobe. And we talked way less about clothes and much more about um, simplicity and living with intention. But I'm definitely going to bring back some version of that. So maybe the Tiny Wardrobe Tour 2.0 on the book tour in 2020. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm just doing um, some speaking things here and there, but not an official tour. Although who knows what 2019 will bring? Who knows? So, you know, just because this podcast is sponsored, you know, in part by REI, any gear that you definitely love having with you in your hiking? Ooh, well, I mean, for me, it's first and foremost that my boots are really comfortable. So comfortable hiking boots. I don't even know what brand they are and I don't have them right in front of me and water. So I know that's not a, that's a awesome. gear thing, that's, but nope, you need water and you so need like shoes. That's all backpack, you need. Backpack, shoes, comfy clothes. Uh, and I try to hike light now. Uh, we used to do a lot of overnight hiking and carrying really heavy packs, but that's not our current reality. And so I love hiking really light with just the essentials. That's awesome. Well, Courtney, this has been such a pleasure. I can't wait till you come back through to La Jolla so I can take you surfing with the Surf Divas. We ask all of our guests just one last question. You know, if you could leave us with just one message right now, if you had an eco-friendly plane that got to fly over the world with a banner that read something, what's your message? My message is that tiny steps matter. And so when you're looking at someone's adventure or story and hearing, you know, the, the end of it, just know that that big change or big wherever they are now is just a result of hundreds of tiny changes and they all matter. So we have to celebrate those tiny steps. Awesome. Thank you so much, Courtney. We will link to your website in the show notes. It has been such a pleasure. Thanks, Shelby. At the end of this podcast, Courtney and I spoke a little about diet. I told her I've tried eating a diet that's vegan, that's raw, water fasting, you name it. She said there's a lot to try. And if you have an autoimmune disease, don't be discouraged. She's tried them all. And don't give up. What works for one person might not work for another. And sometimes different modalities to eating work at different times. So you have to really listen to your body. I thought that was great advice. For more on Courtney and Project 333, her challenge, go to CourtneyCarver.com or BeMoreWithLess.com. We'll have a link to this in the show notes as well. And while you're online, don't be lazy. Be awesome. Write a review on Apple Podcasts and iTunes, which keeps this show free for you to listen to, like. Well, I'll just read you one. This is from 
Court HS15. Beware. This podcast is extremely dangerous to listen to because when I listen at work, every episode makes me want to quit my job and do something wild. Oh, it was really nice of her. It goes on and on. And she says, it leaves me feeling inspired and refreshed. 1010 recommended. Also from Mud MS84, who goes on and says he likes the podcast. And then he says, if he had a party, his would be in a tight valley surrounded by mountains. The devil makes three playing the music. Guest of honor would be Hunter S. Thompson. So you can leave me funny reviews. I totally appreciate those. And you can just leave me good reviews. I like those too. Or you could be honest with me and tell me what you think, but you could just email me those. So thank you again for listening. Thank you to Courtney. Have more Jomo. We'll see you next week. And don't forget... Some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. 